the emergency one on scene. Fentanyl is pure evil. It's an, it's an evil entity that has infiltrated our society. Fentanyl means to me that, uh, I guess, poison. When I think of the word fentanyl, I think monster, I think killer, I think disgusting. The thought of it makes me so angry because this one time that he slipped up after months, one time, and it's just fentanyl and he's gone. It just takes you away in a second, just one second. Fentanyl is um, a very powerful drug that can kill people very quickly. And it's changed the game because it seems to be ending up in everything, not just the heroin. And when it ends up in other drugs, fentanyl can actually kill that person because they're not used to any kind of opiate and now they have this super powerful one in their blood. Connecticut is one of the richest states in the country, yet fentanyl has struck here with a vengeance. Each year, more than 1,000 people in the state die from drug overdoses, with about 75% including fentanyl. Opioids kill far more people than do traffic accidents. Fentanyl, a synthetic opioid, is a killer because it's anywhere from 50 to 100 times more powerful than heroin, gram for gram. It strikes without regard for zip code, class, or race. In fact, the vast majority of people who die are white. Much of what people think they know about opioids is wrong. Opioid use disorder is a chronic, relapsing neurological disease, not a personal failing. Yet social stigma deters many from seeking treatment. Also, because of stigma, many people who seek treatment choose abstinence-based approaches, which work less than 10% of the time. They shun medication-based treatments, which are effective between 60 and 80% of the time. When people don't get effective treatments, and they relapse, and they take fentanyl, they face a high risk of overdose and death. Stigma plus fentanyl equals death. Two decades ago, illicit opioids and opioid addiction were considered an urban problem. Now, opioids are everywhere, from the state's wealthy shoreline suburbs to farming communities to former industrial towns in the hinterland. This scourge resulted from pharmaceutical companies aggressively marketing prescription opioids as a panacea for all sorts of pain. They claimed the drugs were not very addictive, which proved to be false. After people became addicted to prescription opioids, many later turned to heroin and then fentanyl to satisfy their cravings. I'm angry as heck. This is a disease that was completely perpetuated by greed of big pharmaceuticals. How many lives are on their hands? For me in particular, in my family, we really had this sense of like, you know, why, why aren't people doing things about them? Particularly, why isn't the government? How can these pharmaceutical companies get away with this? So it was really this outcry for help. Boston artist Dominic Esposito's brother struggled with addiction, and Esposito was furious at the role the pharma industry had played in the opioid crisis. He crafted an 800-pound sculpture of a spoon to use in protests against the drug companies. We really are out there kind of exposing this web of influence that's happened over the last 25 years, and we really think it's important for us to kind of cut the head off the snake so all that money that trickles down to all these influencers kind of starts to, to disappear. And if you're a senator who's previously taken money or a congressman from pharmaceutical companies, in particular ones that make opioids, um, you're going to think twice about it. So that's really our, our intent. Ground zero for the epidemic is the state's Naugatuck River Valley, 
There, a string of former industrial towns suffer from shuttered factories and lost jobs. The manual labor that caused chronic injuries is gone, but the pain remains. Today, much of the illicit fentanyl is manufactured and smuggled into the United States. Drug gangs here also do their own manufacturing, cooking batches of the deadly stuff in houses, abandoned buildings, and garages. I am surprised that it took the narco-traffickers this long to do it. It solves so many of their problems. It is because it is more powerful, you can get the same amount of doses from, from a smaller package. It's, therefore, it's easier to smuggle. You don't have to grow poppies because it's fully synthetic. It just makes their life much easier. It makes everybody else's life more complicated because it is such a strong drug. Fentanyl is manufactured uh, in Mexico. Uh, once the precursor chemicals arrive there, they produce it in fentanyl labs, and it crosses into the United States from our, our southern borders. It's much easier manufactured than heroin was able to be produced, so the quantity that we're seeing is much greater. I would say about 90% of our investigations are involved fentanyl traffickers. Fentanyl is manufactured death. The last thing I said to him was, Joe, you got to be a good boy, which I always did. And he said, oh my God, Mom, I know that. And then about 5 o'clock, I got the phone call that Joe was picked up in the McDonald's at Whaley Avenue. And uh, by the time I got there, I know he was still alive. So I went into the men's room and I observed that there was a young male on the floor. Um, he was laying down. I saw his feet coming out of a stall and um, he wasn't responsive. In the hallway, right in front of Joe's uh, room, who was having chest compressions and had his clothes cut off, and it's a, it's a terrible thing to see for anybody, let alone a family member. Um, I remember I handed over you know, Mr. Dean's phone to, to him and my son was there. And my son said, the dealer called him, Mom. While Joe was laying there, the dealer called him. And I said, what happened? And he said, well, I picked up the phone and I answered, yeah. And the guy said, yo, it's Jared, how was it? And got to the hospital and he was laying there. I couldn't even look at his face. I didn't look at his face for a good hour. I could hardly touch his hand. Like, I was just freaked out. And the first thing Lisa said to me was, he's not going to make it. Joe Dean led a charmed life. He grew up in a happy family along with his brother Mike. He loved sports. He loved to be with other people and to entertain them. But in high school, another kid gave Joe a pill one day, and he took it, just for kicks. This is normal. This is the culture of our town. This is what high school is. Like, you go and start drinking, you start partying, you do that. It's what you're supposed to do. Experiment, have fun. It's kids being kids. And then you get put in a place where you no longer have a choice to say no. You are already in the deep end. Joe battled his addiction for more than five years. Sometimes he beat the drug for months, then he relapsed. His parents tried every kind of treatment available, including multiple stays at rehab. He didn't want to admit to himself, let alone me, let alone his family, where he was, like what he was doing, and it was embarrassing, and he was so embarrassed by it, because he's this tough guy, and he's just, he's just this confident, person and when he had to admit that he wasn't it was really hard for him the thing about opioids when it gets brought up is 
it gets brought up in framing someone who made poor decisions and is now an addict. And that defines them. And that's not the case. He reeled it back in at times. He was sober for long stretches of times. Um, he went to rehab. He went to a sober house. Detox three times. Um, he struggled so valiantly. It was... It was excruciating watching him hate himself because of his addiction. Since Joe's been gone, we thought it would get better with time. Um, it's gonna be six months coming up. It gets worse. We weren't prepared for that. We're, we're doing it, we're making it happen. But sometimes looking at each other and knowing each other's in pain is unbearable. But the toughest part is not just chit-chatting, because he, he loved to just chit-chat about whatever, or just sitting down to a meal, uh, him coming down the restaurant. This is the session. It is? There you go. Yep. And sweet chili. And this sweet is chili. the sweet chili. Yes, it is. Thank you. How are you doing? Or a simple thing like making him pancakes and him just sitting there eating while I was cleaning up the kitchen. Those simple little things are unbearable to think about. Cameron was a, f a promising football player in high school and at age 14 he had a knee injury and their family doctor prescribed OxyContin and he said he was addicted within days. He described it as taking away his anxiety and making him feel that he could make it through a day. Cameron Herr grew up in rural Pennsylvania. His father died of a heart attack when he was 13. Throughout his teen years and young adulthood, he suffered from anxiety and depression. Even from the time he was like 16, he would call us mom and dad. He'd, he'd refer to us for anything. If anything was going on in his life, he'd ask us. When he moved here, and he, he was in a job he liked, he was in school, he got a checking account, he got a credit card. That was exciting for him. He was sober for five months. One weekend, when the Fareens and their daughter Isabel returned home from an outing, Cameron's bedroom door was closed. So I walked around the bed, and I looked down, and he was on the ground. So I picked him up, and I realized, because I saw the syringe in his arm, that he had overdosed. And so my dad and I had a moment of like, oh my god, oh my god. And my dad called 911, and he was like, go outside right now. He literally was like, get out, get out, go get your mom. So I went downstairs and I got my mom and she knew the minute I said, I was like, mom, she's like, Cameron's dead. From there on, it's just a blur. It was tons of cops. Sorry, I'm getting a little emotional. Sorry. top of East Rock, you really got to witness Cameron find a very special kind of peace. He would just stand and stare out at all areas. He was amazed that he could see the city and the ocean at the same time. He, and he would just climb out there and just stare over there. So that became, we, we, he and I did that together as many Sundays as possible. He would have breakfast and then we would go up East Rock. We did a lot of other trails. The giant steps remained his favorite. In New Haven, Cameron had worked hard on recovery. He attended community college. He worked as a cook. He went to counseling and group therapy. He seemed to be okay. Then he bought fentanyl and died. Addicts are treated, you know, at arm's length. They're, they're not, it's something they, people view it as something they choose, not as, as, as an illness, which it truly is. And people don't understand that. People say they do, but, and then when things like this happen, and I mean, you'd be surprised how many people, friends of ours, who just would back off, 
that in some of them we haven't even seen since this happened. Don't want to talk to us, nothing. It's, it's, a, it's like we have, you know, the plague or something. <laughs> it's bad. So that's the, that's the biggest thing that has to change, people's attitudes towards this. How do you cope when you lose somebody? Um, it was kind of tricky because we were still living in the house. I still worked at the same job. I was still going to the same school. So how do you do it? But I think the biggest thing that I did was I fully embraced what I was going through and I decided to change my major in school. And I said, I want to study addiction. I want to know what he was going through. So I did that. More than a year after Cameron's death, the Farines moved from their apartment to a house in the same neighborhood. They saw it as a new beginning. Kitchen cabinets come in? Yeah, he'll be done in the dining room probably next two days. By Tuesday. <laughs> Damn it. Where the hell did I put it? It was actually a plastic knife, believe it or not. I ripped open the boxes. I have no idea where anything is. We're thrilled for a new chapter, and we're absolutely delighted with the house, but if we could do anything to go back in time so Cameron was with us, that's what we would do. Our son, Alec Pelletier, died on his 26th birthday in Canaan, Connecticut. Uh, he was a bright, um, jovial, warm, big teddy bear. He suffered from a mild um, bipolar disorder. And with that came bouts of depression. And so he started self-medicating as a teenager. And that started a seven-year struggle with opioid addiction. And in the end, Alec was completely, completely dedicated and committed to sobriety. One day, his last day, on his 26th birthday, he always talked about two voices in his head. One that would tell him just one last time, and then you can go back to being normal, and the other one saying, don't do it. And, uh, and the voice got the better of him. And sadly, because of the scourge of fentanyl in our state, in our country, he, that was the last time he was allowed. Jerry was um, just a very loving person, and you always knew his presence. He made sure. He was very outgoing, and he had a lot of friends, and he was um, a very hard worker. He always wanted to become a rock star when he first started, of course, when he was young, younger a teenager in the early 20s, but later as he matured, he started realizing that everything is about rock and roll, that he was, he, now he was writing with more feeling and with more, more purpose. He had been seeing a woman who was extremely intelligent. She had her master's degree, and it was in philosophy, and, you know, she was a beautiful young woman, very bright, and she was a full-blown addict. She, he had used with her, and she had fallen asleep. And he took some of her drugs. He snorted it. That's how he died. We came down on our street, 
and I see Jason going the opposite way. And I said, that's Jason. And I looked and I saw he was crying. And I said, something happened to Jerry. I just knew it was an Endora. I knew it was, it was Jerry. And he turned around and he came home. And we pulled into the driveway. And he says, Mom, he said, Jerry took an overdose. I said, what do you mean? Where is he? And he said, he died. I think about him and talk about him every day. And my wife does too, and my daughter, and Jason. It, uh, it, it had a great impact. I, it's a big loss to our family. He used to work at night as a waiter, and he, he would always come home late, late at night, and my wife would be sleeping, and I'd be watching baseball, because I'm an avid baseball fan. And he'd come in and he'd say, hi, Dad, sit on the couch next to me, and ask me how my day was. And I said, great, how was your day? You know, He'd say, uh, it was great, Dad. He says, I, I miss you all the time. He says, I, I like to be near you, and, and I love you very, very much. He, he tells me this every day, every day when he came home. I guess a message that I would like to send is you never know when it's going to hit home. Uh, this is not something you want to try. Pills off the street are not something you want to try. It could only be one time, and that can be it, and it can change your life forever. You know, I went from, you know, being excellent in school to becoming a full-blown heroin addict. So, and now turning that back around, um, I mean, it's, it's made me who I am today. It's made me a stronger person, but uh, I just want to move forward and you know I still I'm still young I still there's a lot of I still have a lot of time left to you know become who I want to be but I'd love to p purchase a house and you know have a family get married have kids and it's really what I want to do <laughs> just have a simple life Everywhere you look these days, you see news and images from the drug crisis and pledges to do something about it. Yet misguided responses to the problem of illicit drugs in America over the past several decades have caused more problems than they have solved. President Nixon declared a war on drugs that criminalized addiction. That resulted in mass incarceration of people on minor drug offenses. It gave rise to America's prison industrial complex and made life difficult for tens of thousands, disproportionately black and brown people. Only recently have those harmful policies and practices begun to be rolled back. The war on drugs has been going on for a long time. And one thing's for sure, it has not worked. And the fact is that um, this is not a problem we can arrest our way out of. This is not a problem that we can incarcerate people and think it's going to go away. It doesn't. We've been using the wrong tool. At some point, we, we have to stop the insanity and say, this isn't working. What do we need to do to stem the tide of drug addiction? And the first thing is we need to identify what the problem really is what, and, and, and identify all the underlying issues with this problem and then come up with solutions that are going to be sustainable and have people at the table that can actually get that done. Still, there's a vital role for police, dealing with property crimes and violent crimes, which are often related to drug addiction and the drug trade. There's a debate over how hard to come down on drug dealers. Should police focus just on high-volume dealers, or should anybody who sells fentanyl be locked up? And I think there needs to be a healthy uh, balance of laws and enforcement along with treatment. But we need to figure out, okay, 
um, you've been in jail uh, for a couple years and you've confessed to having a drug addiction problem for 12 years. So what have you tried? And okay, let's try something else. And I mean, the courts can order that. The courts have to be more involved in the individual cases. I think if we get the right balance and we look at it as a case per case uh, situation where, okay, you, you didn't try methadone. Maybe you tried a 12-step program, it didn't work. Let's try on methadone. But there needs to be a start and a finish. There needs to be more counselors involved. The police have become counselors. Police also struggle to respond to complaints in some urban neighborhoods where a concentration of drug treatment and service agencies attracts people struggling with addiction and the dealers who prey on them. We've had multiple shootings in the area around the clinic. We've had stabbings that resulted in death. We've had uh, an overdose where a body was actually found in a schoolyard in the morning when children are about to go to school. The opioid problem is all over the state, um, but when you have programs concentrated in neighborhoods like mine, then it becomes a neighborhood problem, a specific neighborhood problem. In addition to the failure of the war on drugs, another misguided response has made it more difficult for society to handle the drug crisis. That's the admonition to just say no to drugs, a government marketing campaign inspired by Nancy Reagan. That campaign fostered the idea that abstinence is the best approach to dealing with addiction to drugs. So it's not uncommon for patients and families to discount evidence-based treatment approaches like methadone and buprenorphine and rather seek abstinence-only types of treatment options. Um, and the consequence of this is huge, okay? So not only are they delaying access to evidence-based treatments that we know that work, they're also increasing their risk of overdose death exponentially, especially in light of the fentanyl crisis. Opioid agonist treatments, methadone and buprenorphine, have been shown in numerous studies over decades of research um, to uh, not only sort of stabilize the chemicals in the brain of a patient with opioid use disorder, but also really have a huge impact on outcomes, okay? So not only from patients using less substances or potentially obtaining from substances, but also regaining employment, reestablishing life relationships, improving maternal health outcomes, decreasing criminal activity. Um, there's very few things we do in medicine that have that widespread of an impact. Connecticut has launched an aggressive response to the opioid crisis, guided in part by addiction experts at Yale School of Medicine. A new website, Live Loud, helps individuals and families get the help they need. The state has begun offering medication for inmates in prisons. It's encouraging collaborations between government, police, healthcare organizations, and social service agencies. There are subcommittees that you can become a part of. Um, so there's a prevention, treatment, recovery, and criminal justice subcommittee. Um, that subcommittee is tasked with coming up with recommendations. So our overall approach to addressing the heroin opiate crisis has been to take a multi-level, multi-agency approach across the state. Um, truly to implement an all-hands-on-deck approach. A key strategy has been to bring in community partners, so people in recovery, to bring in community agencies, uh, to bring in other state departments. Um, really, ev everyone can play a role here in, in making a difference to address this crisis. Some of the most effective treatments for opioid use disorder have existed for decades, and new types and formulations of therapies are being tried with success. They have a new injection, it's called Sublicade. So far I love it. I don't have to worry about taking anything every day. I don't have to worry about anything happening to my prescription or if I do get that little urge, I know no matter what, I, if I even try to use it, nothing's gonna happen. I won't be able to feel anything. So it's that I'm also doing, um, I see a one-on-one -on -one therapist. And um, so I mean, I'm staying pretty busy. Biz boredom is my biggest thing being and, and just me wanting to stay clean, not go back down that road, staying busy, um, focusing on work and my recovery, and that's, that's how I'm staying clean. At the same time, government and health organizations are trying newer approaches to reducing risks, reaching people in need of care, and easing pain and stress. One approach is called harm reduction. The nuts and bolts of harm reduction really is 
to help individuals stay engaged, to keep them safe in whatever negative activities they're practice, practicing at present, uh, with goals of not necessarily promoting abstinence, but at the same time still moving them along a continuum that's getting them to practicing safer behaviors until uh, a change in the behaviors can take place. Narcan or naloxone is the drug that reverses overdoses. So if somebody has just died of an overdose and they've stopped breathing, this drug you can administer by just spraying in their nose or injecting into their arm and it will actually restart their respiratory system and bring them back to life. It's a very powerful drug that we try to get out to all members of the community so that they can be there to try to rescue people who have experienced overdoses. So one night uh, during dinner in the soup kitchen um, somebody approached and said that somebody was in the bathroom not looking well ran to the bathroom and indeed somebody had overdosed um, and I administered Narcan With, under 15 minutes later EMS arrived and uh, that individual walked himself to the stretcher Uh, normally when responding to uh, uh, overdose type of call, uh, the situation is a chaotic situation because mainly the person is unresponsive, their family members are present, so there's a stress level on the family members because they feel that that person is dead or they're dying. We do uh, a rapid patient assessment. We're going to look at the patient, see if the patient's breathing, see if there's a pulse, check in for vitals, pupils, and if at that term we determine that it is an overdose, we're going to immediately give them the Narcan. At the ER, doctors evaluate overdose patients. They educate them about opioids and the dangers of fentanyl, and they try to get them on medications. They also connect them directly to treatment organizations so they don't fall through the cracks. And one of the things that Yale New Haven Hospital is really sort of leading the, the nation on is, is the idea that we really need to um, engage patients uh, we see these high-risk patients in our emergency departments. We need to engage them. We need to educate them. We need to um, provide overdose um, prevention and naloxone resources. And most importantly, we need to make medication that's effective to treat opioid use disorder available. Um, you know, we've studied um, buprenorphine in our emergency department and have shown that people who are started on buprenorphine in the emergency department are t more than twice as likely to be engaged in treatment at 30 days than people who are given sort of a referral or a piece of paper, which unfortunately is still what's most commonly provided sort of at other emergency departments around the country. One of the major challenges facing healthcare organizations is connecting with people who need their help and then staying connected. That way, patients stay in treatment long enough to stabilize and hopefully they remain in recovery. Frequently, Opioid use disorder is intermixed with other medical and social problems, including mental illness and homelessness. So the more progressive healthcare organizations are attempting to address their patients' needs holistically. Trust is a major issue, and increasingly, healthcare organizations use peer counselors to reach out to at-risk people and to connect them with services. So to me, the essence of peer support um, is about people who've been there and done that and are now there to offer um, experiences that can assist others as they are on their own journeys, whatever that may be. You want to try to give back once you get yourself together. So my giving back is, is getting someone else to get that much with this thing called recovery. If I can get into that core of yours, I can get the whole you and let them know that, okay, you made a mistake today. You got high five minutes ago, but where can we go from here right now? I'm not, I can't tell you that I can save you. I can give you some tools so you can save yourself.
In New London, the health department is piloting a program where they send a doctor out into the community with a peer specialist to find people in need. Together, they develop relationships with people, earn their trust, and hopefully get them on buprenorphine to end their dependence on street drugs. So I'm the one that initially is the one that gains the trust with the participant, and then from there, if they trust me, they're going to trust the person that I'm with. I think that I have a gift of being a person in remission of opiate use disorder. Um, in this area, I've been in this area for 20 years, working in the field, active addiction, so I know a lot of people. So sometimes we're in Mystic, sometimes we're in Groton. Um, it's all over. Times have changed to the point where it's not, it's everywhere, it's just not in the city, in the you know lower income areas, it's everywhere. And so even, it sounds really small, like something so simple as I meet you at a Dunkin' Donuts, we talk with you about these medications, and if the situation's right, I prescribe it on the spot, and we will help you make sure you can get to the pharmacy, make sure that you're able to bring the appropriate paperwork to the pharmacy, make sure that your insurance is all squared away. And we make sure that you're able to pick up that medication and start it right then and there. And then we also are able to help people make sure they make that next appointment, which is so critical. Something really, it sounds really simple, but for people struggling with addiction, those little, that little assistance, those little nudges can, can be critical in helping people get into care, helping people get over that hump. It can be, it, it can be the difference between success and failure. Johnny Santos, who struggles himself with drug addiction and homelessness, volunteers with a New Haven program aimed at connecting homeless people with services. What we do is we recommend places for the people that don't have, like where to eat, where to shower, where to get clean clothes, all that stuff, you know, shelter, places to sleep, you know. We refer them to different people, detox, you know, different places like that. We give them the information and then they go ahead and do the footwork. In Connecticut, more K2 overdoses are being reported around a park in New Haven. Emergency crews say they've treated nearly 100 people, all believed to have taken a bad batch of synthetic marijuana. Police have arrested After a massive episode of, of drug overdoses on the New Haven Green, the Connecticut health. Mental Health Center hired a young psychiatrist to provide care for the homeless and disenfranchised where they live and hang out. Our approach is really that we have to meet the person where they're at and we're going to people outside under their, their own circumstances and their own environments. And I think it's a little bit of a radical view, but we ask them, how do, what is the best way to help you? And we take whatever they say you know, as real truth, because I think we so often are tempted in medicine to say, I think I know what's best for this person, and I know what's, what's best for you. And unfortunately, that's not always in line with what the patient feels is best for them and then there becomes this rift and, and kind of disconnection and ultimately a lack of engagement. Many of these innovative outreach programs are being tested on a small scale. They're showing results, but it's unclear if enough money will be available to roll them out statewide. So in terms of whether we have all the resources we need in Connecticut, um, we will always accept additional resources. It will allow us to look at some of the innovations that we have in place and, and to experiment further or to further scale them up. Uh, one strategy has been to blanket the state with a range of programs, again, in each of those spheres, prevention, treatment, recovery, uh, and to have a number of initiatives in each of those areas. Uh, and, and so we are seeing some impacts. Another new direction for dealing with opioid use disorder is the pursuit of alternative treatments. These are add-ons to medication and counseling. They include a wide array of therapies, from acupuncture and aromatherapy to yoga and meditation. So acupuncture is used as one of the integrative services that are available to clients who um, have substance abuse disorders. Uh, it also can include um, nutrition therapy, spiritual support, uh, giving them options for what they want. This is, the whole goal is to bring the person back into wholeness, to bring the person back into wellness.
we help people with substance abuse disorders through acupuncture by allowing the body to re-regulate itself and to balance, put itself back into balance. Um, because when people have trauma or depression or um, uh, cravings, this helps to remind the body that it is safe. With cravings comes anxiety. And anxiety is very scary. You know, it affects people in different ways. You know, sometimes it could be debilitating. And I found that using acupuncture really does decrease my cravings, as well as brings down the anxiety. There's many paths. We talk about many, multiple pathways to recovery, and MAT is one of them, holistic care, you know, yoga, all those things are pathways. And I think as a coach, I like to introduce people to those multiple pathways and pre preparation to when they're ready, when they're at that point, when they come to me and say, you know, Carol, I'm, I think I'm ready to start tapering. A key turning point in recovery comes when people decide it's time to gradually wean themselves off of methadone or buprenorphine to continue recovery without the aid of medication. I believe that we're all recovering from something and we've, we've disconnected and we need to get back to connecting. You know, if that means connecting through treatment, connecting through recovery community, somehow, shape and form, connecting with our families, I, I think that's what I would like to see more of. It is about the criminal penalties on our statutes for fentanyl. My son Joe died this past September 7th of a pure fentanyl overdose in New Haven, as did three other men that night. I'm here to urge the senators to please bring HB 5524 to the floor and to vote yes before the legislative session ends. Lisa Dean joined forces with legislators and other parents who have lost loved ones. They pressed Connecticut's General Assembly to pass a bill increasing the criminal penalties for selling fentanyl to match those for selling heroin. The bill was approved and passed to Governor Ned Lamont for his signature. Hi, Joe. How are you? How are you? Good to see you. He's young. We're about 30 years old the next day. In spite of their crushing grief, Many people who have lost loved ones to opioids channel their sadness and anger in positive directions. They're raising awareness, donating money for improved policing and treatment services, and lobbying for changes in the law. They don't want others to suffer the way they have. That's why it's urgent for, to, to uh, you know, a call to action is needed by everyone. And these politicians have to stand by us. They've got to. They've got to protect their citizens. But we really need our leadership to make this a top-notch priority. We have a lot of challenges in our state that we need to overcome. But if we don't overcome this one in particular, to battle the disease of addiction, we're losing lives. We're losing over a thousand lives every year in this state. I started, attend, I started emailing um, different politicians and I started telling them the story about Dylan. 
I called uh, uh, different pharmaceutical companies and I told them how it was affecting my son and his friends. And I noticed that the rate of death by overdose was rising in Connecticut, whereas it was managing to plateau in some other states. And I felt a very personal obligation to do something to save others in Cameron's honor. Uh, the mayor was incredibly gracious and she was very compassionate. We talked about how we could offer resources as a city and how as a city maybe we needed to change our view on the way addicts are viewed and we need to represent them more as victims. We are doing monthly meetings. We meet with a variety of legislators, of people affected by the opioid crisis, uh, leaders in the community, um, and we are trying to work on the next uh, bit of legislation that we think would be important. One focus of concern is the so-called sober houses. These are dwellings where people who are in recovery live together. Some are run by legit recovery organizations, others by opportunists. There are hundreds of sober houses in Connecticut. Sometimes people overdose and die in them. My son Teddy paid $180 a week, which was half his paycheck for a bed. And he died in his sober house. I'm sorry. There was no structure, no supervision, no criteria. Um, basically, he was there to fend for himself. My understanding when he came out of treatment, I was told I was very lucky that he got into a sober living house. So in my mind, I thought, this is a lifesaver. And that's not what happened. And um, he told me, he said, Mom, this is not the place you think it is. So I believe that the legislature should do is, like you do for many businesses, you have to be able to meet a criteria. If they had to be licensed and they had to meet a criteria, I think it would, it would negate some of these people who are in it just for the profit. So it's, uh, it, it is critical that, that we look at sober homes uh, as an extension of a medical facility and, and, and therefore needs the professional, professional guidance within the home and it needs the standard of care. Now we in the state of Connecticut, we do through the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services, we do have sober homes that are listed that do follow a standard of care, but there are many others out there that are privately run that have no standard of care whatsoever. And I know my son is not the only one who's died in this type of facility. Shortly after Joe Dean's death, his mom and some friends formed an organization, Demand Zero, to help take on the opioid epidemic. We were standing around drinking tea, and we said, you know, there needs to be more awareness, and we need to go after the supply of drugs. They're so easily accessible for these kids that are, are addicted. And we started talking about a nonprofit organization. Demand Zero came about because of that conversation. I only wish I had started it years beforehand but we were busy trying to save Joe's life, but I'm glad we finally did. There are now seven families here tonight that have lost a child to overdose. Um, they're all males. Um, so thank you for being here. The sponsorship, the support has been incredible. One of their first initiatives was donating money so the police could purchase and train two dogs, one specifically for detecting drugs. And very, very proud and pleased to announce that, um, that we're going to be um, partnering with the New Haven Police Department for the first time with a canine, and then who knows what after that. So thank you very much. Thanks, Chief. For her part, Dita Bargava wants to see some of the big pharma companies and their leaders and owners brought to justice. It, it is absolutely criminal. I, I wish these people could be sent to jail because that's where they belong. Um, to me, they've murdered. There needs to be a message that's sent about the, the corporate responsibility for these companies to never let greed. I mean, greed is a drug in itself. And we need to get to the root of that. Yeah,
I hope to help others by using my voice and sharing what it's like as a family and how we can truly educate ourselves to help everyone because this isn't just, it's not this small issue. It's happening to everybody, absolutely everybody. So I hope that using my voice and sharing Cameron's story, I can reach at least one family and and just try to show them that this isn't just them. So this is a, a letter um, that my son wrote to me for Mother's Day um, three weeks before he died. Um, so I'm going to read to you just one excerpt of it just to prove that um, this is a young man who, who cared. So, whew. It's, you said all I want is the best for you, and I believe you, but the thing I want for you, to, for you is to trust me and to be able to say that's my son proudly, to be able not to worry about me or what I'm doing. I want to no longer add stress to your life. I want one day for you to call or ask for help and me be able to do so with a smile on my face as you off, so often did for me and even when I wasn't deserving of such help. And this, you know, my son didn't want to be an addict. He wanted to be, get better. He wanted to live a sober life. You know, like I said, I might have another run, but I don't have another recovery. And I mean that. And I don't want to find that out. Because if I use this time, I'm going to die. You know, I really am. I decided to take my life back. I earned this chair that I'm sitting in. I worked so hard, so many years to be in this chair, and I'm not gonna let nothing dictate or take it from me. You know, I had a real tough life, you know, but I can't dwell on that. I gotta dwell on the today, the right now. Yesterday's gone, tomorrow's not promised. I have to live what was happening now, today. I have no shame. It's just, it's a part, it's recovery and being an addict and, a, and an alcoholic is just a part of me. And I want to carry the message. I want to be that one where I, I'm in a meeting and the next sick and suffering walks through that door. And I want to be able to save them. You know, I know that we can't save everyone, uh, but at least if we just put them under our wing and we show them that, you know, that it's gonna be okay. You know, we, we're all connected in some way. You know, I would like to almost be like a guardian angel to someone. You know, I, I've had that second chance at life and I would like to be able to carry that and help someone else.